Okay, so our next session is on um, habitat conservation planning for conservation discovery. Uh, and it, we've got four wonderful panelists who are going to be uh, speaking on the subject. And the lead or the moderator of that is uh, Barbara Kuss, who many of you know from the USGS. And she's going to get us started off. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning. Um, my name is Barbara Coos. I'm a research ecologist with USGS, and um, as Michael said, I'll be moderating this morning's session. The format that we'll use this morning will include four 15-minute presentations by our four speakers, and then we'll follow that with a panel discussion, um, at which time we'll take questions and engage in lively discussion about everything we've heard about. So our first speaker is going to be Susan Wynn. Susan is a biologist with US Fish and Wildlife Life Service, and she'll be speaking on regional planning. It's dark up here. Good morning. So yes, as Barb said, I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I work here in um, our offices in Carlsbad, and um, we have all of Southern California out of our, of our office here. And um, I'm going to hone in, though, on San Diego County in particular, and I'm going to talk about regional planning. And um, I, I see lots of familiar faces, so some folks you know, are experts on this, and, and some maybe not so much. So this is going to be kind of a high level uh, quick talk about it and um, and then set up to um, for the folks after me to give you a few more details so just this open slide here this is a um, from the san diego national wildlife refuge and um, this is the fish and wildlife services contribution to regional planning in in san diego county um, and it you know if nothing else came of our regional planning in san diego county the refuge did and um, you know, it's a pretty special place. It keeps getting bigger. It connects to um, significant lands owned by uh, BLM and the state. And so it kind of forms the cornerstone of our um, reserve planning here in San Diego. So with that, got it. All right, so why regional planning? Well, we only needed to look north and um, take a look at LA and say, mm, we don't want that. Um, you know, ideally, you would do regional planning before you have nothing developed. Of course, we didn't have that luxury, but we were a few steps ahead of LA and still had quite a bit of natural open space. And so, you know, if nothing else, here's our motivation. You know, we kind of had Camp Pendleton holding the line, and um, and so this is sort of the the why. We don't want to look like LA. So uh, Todd Keeler Wolf, you know, gave a great overview of California and the biodiversity in California, honing in on San Diego County. As you can see, you know, we we have all the things he talked about. We have diversity of rain. We have a lot of topography, which then results in a lot of listed species. We've got over 100 federally listed species. We have lots of endemic species. We have vernal pools, which he talked about at the end. Um, and so, you know, we, we, are, we are a prime example of that biological diversity hotspot. We've got over 500 species of birds. So just like you can go swimming in, in Palau, you can, you can go birding in San Diego and, um, and see quite a bit. We've got an incredible number of plants and mammals, you name it, we have it. We also have a, a lot of threats, and um, you know, the, as our landscape first was was impacted with veg, with uh, agriculture, and then more recently with urban development, and all the things that come with that. So you've got human use, you've got um, hydrology changing. Our ephemeral streams are becoming perennial due to urban runoff, and so how to manage these threats in this highly diverse area you know, with an incredible population of people. And so again, regional planning starts to become the answer because it, it allows you to try to minimize those threats by having a reserve design, bigger blocks of habitat, connectivity, some of the things that can mitigate the impacts from those threats. So with those threats and that high level of diversity, you know, we you end up with a lot of listed species. And so this slide shows, 
the darker the color, the more listed species in each of those, in each of those tiles. So each tile is about three and a half square miles. The darker colors have up to 11 listed species in that one tile. There's 66 species listed within five miles of an urban edge. So that, that creates a tension between the ongoing land use, people use, and how to protect this diversity. Again, the thought was, well, maybe regional planning is, is our answer. This is how we're going to uh, manage this, this tension and hopefully find a way forward. So then it brings us to the California gnat catcher. And, and this was really the catalyst that, that tipped the scales and encouraged everyone to work together. This was the first species that was listed that really affected a lot of the upland um, habitat. So up till this point, a lot of our listed species were in wetlands, they were in vernal pools, they were along the coast, um, but they weren't across the lands that wanted to be houses. And, and so with the listing of the gnat catcher, it really highlighted the need to start planning, to start working together, to identify those areas that were um, you know, best to be preserved and those areas that could be best developed. And, um, and, and also uh, an idea that maybe the state and the feds should work together. And um, so with that idea of working together, and I'll bore you with a little legal framework. So under the Endangered Species Act, we can list species as threatened. And when we list a species as threatened, we have um, the option to do a special rule, a 4D rule. And in that 4D rule, we can define sort of the rules of the game. And, and so in this instance, that 4D rule was linked to a state rule, the NCCP Act. And the idea was that, well, if you were working under an NCCP, Natural Communities Conservation Planning Act, and you were focused on conserving habitats, may, well, one, you need some time to plan. So we will, we will give you some time to plan and allow some impacts in a more simplistic process and with the hope that you're gonna come up with this regional plan. And so, so the listing of the gnat catcher really married the Fish and Wildlife Service at the federal level to the Fish and Wildlife Service at the state level. And um, in San Diego County in particular, we, we started working together, sending joint letters, working with our local jurisdictions on this planning process. And there is a lot of people in this room. I see Bob Leiter, Tom Oberbauer, Keith Greer, who, who were very intimately involved in that process. So why coastal sage scrub? Why did the state pick coastal sage scrub as their pilot NCCP? Well, for one, as all the things you heard this morning, high diversity of species, lot of high level of fragmentation of loss, 85% lost, and highly threatened. All those threats that we talked about were, were focused here. I think there was also no thought of, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere, right? So, so honed in on the coastal sage scrub, the listing of the gnat catcher. So uh, the, the thought was, well, okay, so the, at the state level, we have this habitat focus of coastal sage scrub. Which species, you know, looking at it from the other side of the, of the coin, which species would capture that sage scrub? And so three focal species were identified, the California gnat catcher, the orange-throated whiptail, and the cactus wren. And the thought was that each of those species capture a different component of the sage scrub or use it in a slightly different way. And so if you were able to address those three species, you would be capturing the, the entirety of that habitat type. But we didn't limit it to coastal sage scrub. So other habitat types were also addressed, chaparral, grassland, woodlands. And they're also thinking again about connectivity. So species like mountain lion and deer, uh, golden eagles, you know, wide-ranging species badger were also included in the plans to address that. How do, you, how do you connect the landscape with the idea if you can connect those larger animals, you're probably connecting the, the smaller animals as well. So looking at Southern California, we, the region was, was way too big, way too complicated at a political level to plan it all as one unit. Um, and so the region was broken down into smaller units, mostly related to local politics, local land use, because that's where the, the decisions were gonna be made, that was the implementation. And so this, this shows you the broad region, you can see Orange County, Riverside County, um, San Diego County, and the different planning areas that, 
that were identified, little poor ranch of Palos Verdes up in the north, um, with a little bit of LA that's left. Um, and that plan is like days away from being finalized. So now zooming into San Diego County. So right now in San Diego County, we have three active planning areas, a fourth in the East County as well. Um, MSCP was the first plan to be approved, the Multiple Species Conservation Plan, and it covers the southwest portion of the county. It's shown in green. The darker green are all the areas that have been permitted. The lighter green areas are the areas that haven't finished a plan yet, Santee being the largest portion there. Um, covers 85 species. Uh, it identifies 172,000 acre preserve that occurs across that landscape. Moving to the north, the MHCP, Multiple Habitat Conservation Plan, covers those north seven jurisdictions. Carlsbad in dark blue there is the only permit that's gotten a plan, but the conservation design is done for that area as well. And then we have the North County Plan, which is the unincorporated lands, and um, it's a work in progress. And, um, and so the idea being that these, th these three planning areas capture that coastal sage scrub. The East County Plan has a teeny bit of coastal sage scrub, um, but it's, it's really addressing a lot of different unique species out there. And even the East County Plan does have some conservation design that's been completed. Um, so those are your San Diego plans in, um, that are moving forward. So now I'm gonna hone in on just the Southwest Multiple Species Conservation Plan because it's the one that's the most um, done. And so you can see on the right is the, the conservation design. So this idea of large blocks of habitat with connectivity between them in the orange, the linkages. Um, on the, the other map is showing you the area that's actually already been conserved. So MSCP is well on its way with its conservation design and delivery. It's almost 70% complete. Um, so all that dark green land is actually already in open space and being managed and monitored. Um, so it's, it's well on its way, um, but the, you know, the linkages and some of the small, you know, the connectivity is, is really a challenge, but you know, we've done a, a good job of starting those big blocks of habitat, and you can see that large block in the bottom, that's where the refuge and the Otai Mountain and the state ecological reserves are anchoring this plan. So now that we have a reserve and we have a, a plan, the, qu the question becomes, well, what's next? Like, what do we do with it? What did we get? Where, is it working? Did we design it right? It, it took a lot of, of thought and a lot of smart people to put the lines on a map, but they're lines on a map. And, and it turns out that figuring out now what to do with the land and those lines on the map might be even harder than the planning. You know, by the time we got to planning in San Diego County, it's kind of, well, what's left is what we need to conserve. And so now figuring out what's in our basket and, and how, to, how to do with, you know, manage what's in our basket is, is sort of the next stage of the delivery. So we're moving into that top part of the circle of, of the management and monitoring and, um, you know, often referred to as adaptive management. In San Diego County, the, the San Diego Management and Monitoring Program, which is, is funded out of transnet money from SANDAG and sits with USGS, is our entity that is really trying to, to coordinate that management and monitoring. You know, they're the conductors. And I encourage everyone to go to the portal um, because all the data that's being collected as part of this, this you know, countywide experience is there. So you have a question about a species, you have a question about a preserve, you have a question about, you know, the study you heard about. In theory, it should all be on that website. And, um, so I'm giving a little plug for SDMMP, but that, that is our entity that's coordinating our efforts. And um, you're gonna hear a lot about some of those efforts from Robert and Barb after me, but um, please check out SDMMP. So I'm gonna then now, they asked me to talk a little bit about connectivity within, within this region. And you know, I, I don't do any of the connectivity research. There's lots of people out here that, that do this stuff. But you know, from the services standpoint, again, we're kind of a coordinator because not only do we work in San Diego County, but we work in Orange County, Riverside County. You know, we get to see the bigger picture, and and so you know, in, in addition to connecting the landscape and the animals, we need to connect the people, and and so you know, in the funding and coordinate those sorts of things. And so that's a lot of what my role in in life is these days. Um, and uh, anyway, so for San Diego, the 
early on as part of SDMMP, one of the first management strategies that was put together was this one on connectivity. And so they've, they had a bunch of workshops and brought in experts and kind of broke it down into three different categories, looking at, again, those large animals um, and movement that are moving on the ground, small animals that are moving you know, smaller through the landscape, and then birds thinking about things that fly and thinking that, well, something that flies might move differently than, than something that crawls or slithers or walks. Um, so the connectivity strategy initially was published in 2011. Um, it's been updated. Um, there's been more recent workshops, so it's, it's a sort of work in progress. But a lot of this first in efforts has been done. And, um, and then ideally, those results are then feeding into actual actions on the ground. So identifying pinch points. Hey, if this culvert was cleared out, if this bridge was, was you know, maintained and the, the homeless folks were kept out or what, what have you, you know, trying to identify those places in the landscape where um, we can actually you know, strategize and target our efforts. Where's the most important place to, to work on? So I'm going to kind of zoom up and down. So at the most local level, you know, looking at, um, you know, in San Diego County or in, or I mean, in the city of San Diego or city of Carlsbad, like really looking in at the local preserve level, you know, looking at the local reserve level, looking at under crossings, how, how are things moving, you know, where, where are things still connected, where are things not connected? Um, so USGS has done a lot of work, CNLM has done a lot of work looking at local connections. Um, they've also looked at, hey, we've got culverts, but are they working? Are there things we can do to make them more effective? So big animals, small animals, maybe there's structure we can put within them to get small animals through. This is, again, work by USGS. Um, thinking about birds, looking at, well, maybe birds aren't going through culverts. How are they doing? So uh, USGS has done work with gnat catchers. You can see, for the most part, they're still connected. So we're doing okay there. Zooming up, okay, well, what about how does our region connect to the, uh, the larger regions at large? There's been a lot of work done at the eco-region level by lots of folks over the years. They all hone in on some key pinch points. Um, the one of them that the, is local here in San Diego is this connection between the Santa Anas and across the 15. So this is right at the San Diego Riverside County line. And, um, and so that's, this has been a pinch point for mountain lions. The mountain lions and the Santa Anas are, are um, suffering from bottleneck and small population size. And so again, this is an effort that's kind of a beyond any one plan. But because we have these plans, we've brought people together, working with Caltrans and others to try and figure out how to get mountain lions across the 15. And I think I'm gonna do it. Here's my last slide. <laughs> so, you know, is it worth it? Have, have, have we been successful? Well, if nothing else, I think this slide highlights that it's made a huge difference. So the dark green is the existing open space in the 80s. And the light greens are the areas that have come in or will come in through our regional planning and connecting to those blue lands, which are the existing public lands. And you can see a lot of green on that map. And so, so the regional planning in San Diego really is gonna, in the long run, connect our region. And, and we may not get exactly what we targeted, but we're gonna get something. And um, so I think you can see that it's made a huge impact on our, on our maintaining our biodiversity in the region. And of course, it, it takes partnerships. And so I'm sure I'm missing plenty, but a um, lot, a lot of people, a lot of you in this room working on this effort. Boom. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is me, and I will be talking about effects of wildfire on bird communities. Wildfire is becoming increasingly a threat to protecting wildlife in the HCPs. This map is showing um, in gray the urban uh, areas, the yellow 
shows coastal sage scrub habitat, and these big orange blobs represent wildfires since 2002, including several catastrophic wildfires during the last 15 years that have burned hundreds of thousands of acres. So USGS has a very active research program addressing fire, um, trying to learn about how fire affects plant and animal communities and what we can do to manage the, those threats before, during, and after fires. And I'd like to acknowledge SANDAG and Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton and California Department of Fish and Wildlife for funding the research um, that I'll be talking about today. So when I talk about wildfire, I'm going to be considering it in a broader context that includes weather and, in particular, precipitation, um, specifically the extremes in precipitation that produce either drought conditions on the one hand or wet years on the other hand. And when you live in an arid environment like we do, even years that receive just average rainfall can feel like wet years against the backdrop of the drought years um, that have been quite prolonged in the last couple of decades. And so precipitation uh, interacts with fire to affect both the intensity and the frequency of fires and also recovery um, following those fires. So if we look at um, data for annual precipitation in San Diego for the last 170 years or so, you see that it's highly variable. We practically never have average years. We uh, instead have um, either fairly extreme dry years um, alternating with wet years. And if we hone in on just the last 20 years or so, you can see that this period has been characterized pretty much by drought years. Uh, there are some notal, notable events during this period. For example, in 2002, we had the driest year on record out of those 170 or so years. And then a couple years later, in 2005, we had the third wettest year ever. Um, 2014, in addition to being a very dry year, was the warmest year on record. So even within a period of just a couple decades, we can have these wild extremes. And so the context for wildfires um, can be very different. For example, the 2003 fire occurred um, and then was followed by that record-breaking wet year. In contrast, the 2007 fire um, occurred and was followed pretty much by dry years. And then the 2014 fire has been followed pretty much by wet years. So this makes a difference in how habitat and associated species can be expected to recover. So I'm going to talk about a couple examples today um, of how we approach our fire research. And um, fundamental to both of these examples is the principle that in order to understand the effects of fire on birds and other wildlife, we have to understand the effects of fire on habitat. So a big part of our research is monitoring habitat. Um, the species, uh, I'll start out by talking about an example with coastal sage scrub habitat and the species that Susan introduced you to already is the California gnat catcher. This has become the flagship species for coastal sage scrub conservation. And our approach to examining it fire effects on gnat catchers and, and their habitat um, is to use a framework that includes hundreds of sampling points. This is a, a part of our study area in coastal San Diego County. We visit these points once every four years, and we document gnat catcher presence or absence, and we collect data on vegetation structure and composition. And um, what we found is that gnat catcher occupancy, or the percent of these points that are occupied by California gnat catchers, is much higher in unburned areas than it is in areas that have undergone wildfire. The more recent the fire, the lower the occupancy. But even after a, a more than a decade, occupancy of habitat is roughly half of what it is in the unburned or pre-burned um, 
condition. So birds definitely take a hit. Um, with our vegetation data, we've been able to identify predictors of gnatcatcher occurrence, both positive, uh, like the amount of cover of California sagebrush, California buckwheat, other species, and also negative um, factors like the cover of grass, which in, in particular is exotic annual grasses, the um, total herbaceous cover, which again is largely exotic species, and then the shrub, laurel sumac. These tend to inhibit gnatcatcher occupancy and it turns out that these are the species that increase after fire. And our results so far are suggesting that this uh, process of recovery may take six to seven decades until occupancy achieves the pre-fire level. So we're very interested in figuring out how to promote recovery by enhancing um, regrowth of these species um, and how to inhibit or manage or reduce these negative factors that are making the habitat unsuitable for gnat catchers and other associates for a very long time. We'll be repeating um, our site visits this year in 2020, so we're very interested to see what our recent rainy years um, will do in terms of the shape of this relationship. The second example I want to talk about relates to fire in riparian habitats. Now, historically, most of our big fires have been in upland, coastal sage scrub habitat, but uh, recently we've had some large fires that have burned uh, riparian habitat, and so that's giving us a chance to learn about relationships there. And our species of interest in the riparian is the least bells vireo. This is a migratory species that's present during the spring and summer and breeds exclusively in riparian woodlands. And I think that you'll agree that wildfire pretty much removes the habitat structure um, needed by these and other riparian breeding birds. Now, riparian habitat can recover quickly. It's you know, obviously a, a wetter environment. Um, and you can have resprouting beginning within a year of a fire. For example, a fire like this that takes place in the fall can be resprouting um, by the next spring. And within a couple of years post fire, you can have recovery of the lower and mid canopy regions. So we've been monitoring vireo populations everywhere for a long time. And so that puts us in a good position when fires occur to be able to compare before and after fires and learn about recovery. Um, these are vireo population sizes for a number of sites that subsequently burned. The first year after the fire, abundance was depressed in most of those sites. But by two years later, populations had met or exceeded the pre-fire levels. So this can happen very quickly. Um, we attribute this effect to the fire by comparing these burned sites to unburned sites, where again, we see the pre-fire populations in those unburned sites. We didn't see that second year depression. We saw some increases in some sites and then the increases in year two. So this recovery in, in riparian can, can occur quickly. It doesn't always occur quickly. It's going to be a function of the severity of the fire, the precipitation context following the fire. Um, and then just as I mentioned with the gnat catcher example, exotic species invasion following fires um, can influence recovery to a great degree. Here, the exotic of concern is giant reed, which can spread through burned drainages and just take over, and it displaces the native willows and other species um, and renders the habitat um, basically unsuitable. So this could be um, an area uh, in which we would want to focus management to, again, accelerate recovery by setting the stage for the natives and getting rid of the factors that are inhibiting recovery of the natives. 
So Susan talked about connectivity at the end of her presentation. Connectivity is what allows us to avoid putting all our eggs in one basket. And these corridors that she was describing facilitate processes that are going to be really important to recovery of post-fire areas. They not only facilitate movement out of burned areas and into other um, sites as animals seek refuge, but they facilitate movement back into those areas once they've been recovered. So um, it, it's, uh, we can't underestimate that it's not enough to just um, you know, set aside a big chunk of land. We want to have multiple chunks of land, and we want them to be interconnected. So I just wanted to offer some final thoughts about wildfire. Um, it can take a long time, and there's a lot of complexity in these interactions with weather. We didn't even talk about temperature, but there are other interactions with weather and other factors that it takes a long time um, to observe and to understand. Habitats differ in their response to wildfire, and species within the same habitat can respond very differently to wildfire, so there's a lot to learn there. Um, it's probably a good idea for us to focus on what we can manage, because there's a lot we can't manage. We can't manage the weather, for example, so we really need to find the things that we can do that will make a difference, given that some of this is out of our control. And then finally, we need to be prepared for the new normal. The events that we've had in recent years are not anomalies. They're part of the new environment um, that you know a lot of modeling is suggesting we need to get used to because it's the new environment that we will be working in um, as we face the challenge of trying to protect um, these species within our HCPs. So um, I'll conclude my comments there and introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Robert Fisher. Um, Robert is a, what is Robert? Robert is a, <laughs> I'm looking. Who's Robert? <laughs> Robert is a research wildlife biologist at USGS. For some reason, we don't have the same title, so I never remember his. And he is going to be speaking on I'm like the worst moderator ever right now. <laughs> Robert's going to be speaking on biodiversity and discoveries within the context of HCPs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> And I was timing Barb's talk, and I see that I have some extra minutes because she finished early, so I'm going to use those. Um, then we're even right. Oh yeah, right. We're even. Um, so I'm going to talk about two different concepts. One is kind of just what is biodiversity. I'm going to talk a little bit about it philosophically. We heard more about it quantitatively earlier from Todd, and then I'm going to talk about what are our predictions about new species discoveries within a biodiversity hotspot. And so we talked about the coral triangle earlier, that Todd talked about that, and I think that's great, and it's amazing, and all this stuff, but I'm gonna talk about why our backyard is equally amazing. And so um, that's kinda like the two themes of, of my talk, um, and how we should, uh, as I move forward, you'll see that. Oops, I'm doing the Susan thing. There. Um, so, uh, this is just observations of a naturalist in California 170 years ago, let's say, and this is Cooper. And, and at that point, when you were going between LA and you know, into the Mojave, the kinds of things you saw were, let me just hold this, um, were cougars, grizzly bears, raccoons, badgers, you know, bobcats, antelope, and mountain sheep. And, and that, that's how we described biodiversity then in the 1860s. And those things were obvious. And, and you know, he just spent a couple of days going across from, from uh, 
Palos Verdes across. And so that's kind of one concept of biodiversity and is these large things that you, you kind of see. I'm gonna talk philosophically about biodiversity. What is biodiversity and how do we think about it? So this is an amazing paper from 20 some years ago by, um, by Ross Keister. And he, he kind of tries to delve into the aesthetics of bio, biodiversity. And so um, he uses the word sublime quite a bit. So there's the dictionary definition of sublime. I have to read it here because I, um, it's of such excellence, grandeur, or beauty to, as to inspire great admiration or awe. And that's how we can kind of maybe think about biodiversity. So from, from Keister's paper, I'm going to show a couple of, of different phrases. So he talks about managing for the sublime. And, and that's, you know, might be an oxymoron, but basically, you know, what he says, however, it is certainly possible to manage in such a way that the possibility of a sublime experience is more likely. And we're talking about sublime being a biodiversity experience and encouraging systematics and taxonomy and the institutions such as this place, um, which promote them uh, is uh, one way to have this uh, sublime experience. And I'm gonna read these slides because I was in the back of the room earlier and I know people in the back can't see the bottom of the slides. And so, so, so biodiversity is sublime and it's this in, in your imagination. Another way to manage for sublimity, which I think is a made up term he did, uh, may be to declare certain areas as forbidden to entry. And those might be wilderness areas or those might be just areas we're trying to do conservation because there, you being there puts that conservation at risk. But, but it also, the biodiversity in those areas then can only be imagined and through time could acquire some sublime impact. So you think about like not being able to go someplace and how you think about what's there. So a lot of people never go to Camp Pendleton and they think, wow, that's gotta be this amazing place with bears and everything out there. But and, and because it's not open to the public. And there's other places that are kind of like that. And so you, you're, you're thinking about that as that sublime experience you're having. And so then he also goes on to, that if biodiversity is indeed sublime, then our aesthetic appreciation of it does not depend on immediate sensory encounter with its elements. That means you don't have to see a mountain lion and sit with a mountain lion to enjoy a mountain lion. And, and, and so that's an important point, but rather through its effects on our imagination. But so then he asks this question, which is really a key one. What's the difference would extinction make of a species? Like, like just because there were grizzly bears here, they're not here anymore, but they still occur on our list. Grizzly bears occur in San Diego County or occurred in San Diego County. So my question is, what about the things we don't know? This is the, the Donald Rumsfeld thing, right? The unknown unknowns. So if things that we don't know go extinct, then look, we, they're never gonna be on the list. And so discovery still needs to be part of what we do down here. And we need to be planning for discovery the way we plan for um, things we know. So therefore, uh, this is still from Keister's paper, funding for the conditions that allow species to continue to survive or otherwise working towards them and allows us to participate in the condition of possibility. So even though we're doing reserve design for the gnat catcher, um, we're, we have to do it in a way that allows for the things we don't know to, to exist. And so then, so his point about investing in conservation solutions is really the goal of habitat conservation planning. And then this investment should continue to lead to discovery. And so then, um, my hypothesis has been that within a biodiversity a hotspot, we should continue to discover new species at high rates. That's a logical assumption then, because we are a global biodiversity hotspot. So then let's first review the things that are on our lists that might not be here anymore, or are not here anymore, like the grizzly bear, the condor, the wolf, the pronghorn elm, antelope, the red-legged frog, yellow-legged frog. These are things that are no longer, let's say, in San Diego County. Some things are no longer anywhere, like the California condor louse. And that, it's gone extinct because when the condors were brought in captivity, they, they um, were cleared of parasites, and so that now doesn't occur anywhere. And so some of these things, there's hope for the future to bring them back into this region if we do conservation correctly. Okay, oh, I lost my timer. Um, so back to Cooper. So Cooper, these are the things we imagined from biodiversity in the 1860s. So these are eagles. So, so we, we feel good to know that there's eagles here. We don't get to see this interaction with eagles. The camera catches it and then I can display it for you, but we don't get to see it. But knowing that that's happening, it makes us feel good and that's that sublime part. Here's lions. We wanna know lions are there 
We want to know they're in the environment, but we don't want to run into them, especially three of them when you're hiking alone. <laughs> like, like, we don't want to do that. That's from my friend Ben Dial. Uh, had that, that's a quote from him I've had in my head. Like, knowing that they're there gives you an appreciation of them and that we're doing the right thing for connectivity, like Susan talked about, but, but I don't need to see three of them when I'm hiking at night. And then, you know, deer, that's the other thing we think a lot about, right? So those are the things we think about wildlife that relates back to 170 years ago. And then there's other things like ringtails, which we know are out there. They're really hard to find. And we are now developing monitoring techniques to better find things like ringtails, better find things like badgers. And, and those are things that then tell us about connectivity, tell us about um, biological integrity of a landscape, that they're persisting in that landscape. So then there's this other concept I'm going to introduce. It's called biological annihilation. And so that talks about this idea that um, there's a strong focus on species extinctions. So the, an extinction is the last individual of the, of the last population of an animal dying. That's an extinction, right? So that, there's no coming back from that. So what they talk about is this focus on that and focus on, like Susan said, there's 100 endangered species in the, in the area. We're focused on things that are going extinct. The, their, their, their point is more that there's a common species of low concern that are continuing to dwindle in numbers of populations over time. And the numbers of populations and the numbers of individuals within a population is this massive anthropogenic erosion of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And so this is just our map from 2003 from our paper of um, kind of, uh, I call it the development impact model for Southern California, where you can see where the, the footprint of people or infrastructure is, is greater and where it's lesser. And then that biological annihilation is pretty clear when you're looking at that of where we're going to be losing those populations and losing those species. So, so what, we want, what I wanted to do, and I'm going to talk about right now, is how we're trying to assess what those minimum patches should look like for maintaining biodiversity so we're alleviating that annihilation and and then tying that back to what Susan was showing was what our goals for for reserve design are so so we've determined this then relationship between species richness and patch size for small terrestrial vertebrates because they're a big they're a good group we can Look at how eagles are flying around. We can look at how lions are using the landscape. But this middle trophic level that doesn't move around between patches, um, we need to know how to make those patches functional for them so that they have long-term viability. And we uh, alleviate this biological annihilation. So by then assessing this, what this means for conservation landscape regards to maintaining biodiversity. So if we do this well, that should lead to continued also discovery, and that's my hypothesis. We should be discovering things within these patches. So we've identified 97 habitat patches that contained our pitfall trap arrays. These are, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details because I'm probably running out of time, but um, our patch sizes are about from half a hectare to about 80,000 hectares. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, and then we, we looked at a group of 45 terrestrial vertebrates. These are things with low vigility, so they're not gonna cross between patches. And we got about 110,000 captures of these species, and then we analyze this with the multi-species um, occupancy models. And so when we do this, we can see that um, within a patch and within a site within a patch, there's a, a strong trend, which we would, uh, we would expect, between patch size and diversity. And then this top, these little black dots, are null model richness. And that's what we predicted that patch would have had if it was connected to other patches. And so we can see this species loss, and that's that biological annihilation. And so what we want to do is figure out where do we have patch sizes that we don't have that annihilation, and that's about 5,000 hectares and a larger, is where, what our goal should be, because we're alleviating that, that loss of small populations. And some of these are smaller than that, and these have an extinction debt, these ones in red, um, which are places that are going to continue to lose species, as we would predict, because they're smaller than that inflection point. And so those are places we want to have to mitigate situations to, to try to, like, put in barriers or something to keep them from falling off of those, those reserves. So then, what's that look like on the landscape? So this is just that coastal sage cub, kind of low elevation chaparral landscape in Southern California. And what we've got is we've got about 200, well, we had 2 million hectares of land totals. So this is cutting off the forests. About 
currently there's about a million hectares in open space remaining in 6,400 patches throughout that landscape. And we've protected about 500,000, half a million hectares of open space in the conservation in 2,200 patches. So, so our, that's on the left is what's possible still. And that's what's not developed, open space still in the landscape. This is what we've got in conservation, and that relates back to what Susan's showing. What I want to show in here is that teal and blue are the they're over that threshold of 5,000 hectares. And so we want to take the green ones, which are between 1,000 and 5,000 hectares, and, and build them out to get over that threshold. And then that gives you resiliency to, um, to, to loss, to biological annihilation. That's kind of our, 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 our hypothesis that we've kind of shown with real data. So then what can we say about discovery? So I just have a few minutes left, so let's quickly assess this. So, um, for birds, pretty much this is decadal bird discoveries uh, by, up from the beginning of time, let's say, until 1960. And so what you can see is that North America, we, you know, Europe first and then North America, we had pretty much all of our bird discovery done by the 1870s. So we wouldn't expect to find a lot of new species of birds in this biodiversity hotspot because globally we kind of have a good handle on it. This book by Brewer shows that since 1960 there's only 288 new birds described globally and most of those are from, the, uh, from South America and the tropics in, in Southeast Asia. So that's not a good model for discovery. But we can look at, for San Diego County, these other two studies. This is from 1998. This is the um, Prentice, the spider study that was done at Camp Pendleton and Miramar. And they got 200 spider species, of which 10%, they predict, are 10% are undescribed species. They can't identify them. Many of those are now described, because that's a 20-year-old study. More recently, James Hong's paper came out. And he had 235 bee species from his patches in San Diego County. And of those, 17% or 40 bee species are probably new species. So, the, so we have a lot of discovery we're still doing today. I'll show you some examples. I'll let CNN explain it. So. How about this one? Have you ever heard of yellow-bellied legless lizards? They look like snakes and live in various parts of California. Scientists are only now learning about the creatures, but we're told they have been around for millions of years. How could it be that they're only now learning about them? That's crazy. <laughs> Where have they been? No, that's so weird. And how, we got photos of them. All right, uh, <laughs> thanks, Susan. So, so like that literally was a sublime experience for Anderson Cooper right there. How do they know? Like, like how, how come we didn't know this? That this was, in, this was just newly described and it's here in San Diego. That's Aniela Stebbins' eye. And so, so, I mean, they had a, a, a sublime experience there. So these are not just genetic studies that say there's new species. So this is this Philistinella spider group. And this is uh, a map of the phenol, female genitalia. And, and they're basically describing these species based on that morphology as well as, as genetics. And so there's real morphology that's being applied to, to these taxonomic problems. Here's a, here's a half dozen ants that occur in San Diego County. A lot of these have hairy heads. And I'll show you the next one that doesn't. Um, and there was, I, we, I've, I've, so I've been building this database since the mid 90s of new discoveries. And I'm trying to, I'm capping it in 19, um, uh, 2019 to say, okay, over the last 30 years, what are the new discoveries we've had from Southern California? So we've got 18 species of ants. 12 of those species are, new, uh, are only in, um, uh, well, occur in San Diego and elsewhere. 18 occur in that footprint in Southern California. So here's just half a dozen that occur in San Diego that are newly described. And you can see the years they were described. Hey, stop. Okay, that was my timer. This, uh, I'm almost done, Barb. Um, this one is really cool, and this is called Temnothorax anaphylantis. And anaphylantis is from the Greek with the bald forehead. So that's like me, getting a bald forehead. And so this one is interesting. That, and so you can name species for what they look like, and, and as, as a way, like, that's how you're separating it from these ones with these setae on their heads, or these hairy heads. This is a map that just shows different species of temnothorax that were described in 2014 and their localities in Southern California. This one, you can describe them as patronyms, so you're naming it after somebody. So this is Neopalpa Donald Trump eye. And this one was described because 
of the resemblance of the scales on the head to the, to the, of this moth to, to Mr. Trump's hairstyle. That's, that's what it says. And so, um, and then also they put the reason for this choice of name is to be, bring wider attention to the need to continue to protect fragile habitats in the US that still contain many undescribed species. So, and this one doesn't occur in San Diego, but occurs in Western Riverside County and Imperial County. But, but it's a really good one to compare against the bald-headed ant, this uh, hairy moth. Um, and then these are some others that were discovered on that Miramar study. So this is Solcal clemmi, so that's a new genus of spider, Miramar. And then this is a, the, just a crazy looking little jumping spider. Um, here's some, these are hymenoptera and wasps. Parasitoid wasps, that's just a crazy looking thing, this Mexamalis, Skinnerensis from Lake Skinner, a new species of salt marsh daughter. This is uh, one of my favorites, I'm almost done, Barb. Um, this is a uh, uh, new mustard from San Diego and West Riverside County called Sibiropsis. It was a new genus and species. And so generic discoveries are still being made in Southern California, and that's, that's a key piece. Um, and then these are just some mixes of different other taxa that have been described. And so you see there's a lot of diversity of species we're discovering in Southern California. And, and you say, okay, well, they're all kind of small, and there's no birds, and so I'm not really, who cares? And then there's the whale. So this is a new whale that the type locality is Carlsbad. And I'm only counting this whale because they were only found on land. So these are beach whales. And, and it's also to, to think about the, the link between what we're doing on land and this landscape in Southern California has an impact on the sea. And this is a biodiversity hotspot in the sea. And I haven't been calculating all the sea new species, but that's a whale that weighs a ton. And it's 14 foot long. And it was described in 2002. There's the whale. It's a beaked whale. It's actually got teeth. And so that's a, the, the skull of that individual. That's the lower mandible with the teeth. So then here's a summary of 100 genera. OK, I'm done. Um, from, New, from Southern California. And all the ones in bold are um, new genera. And, but the, all these genera have new species from here. And again, this list is just sublime looking at it. And so basically, that's the end. Um, what does HCP success look like for this hotspot? Then we should be still discovering new species in our backyard, this diversity of new species, a recovery of extirpated species when feasible, a system of conserved lands where discovery can continue, and a system of conserved lands that are resilient to outside drivers. Okay, and I'll end with that. Thanks, Barb. Thank Okay, so our final speaker this morning is Mark Kramer. Mark is the Director of Federal External Affairs for the California Chapter of Nature Conservancy, and Mark will be speaking on the butterfly effect. Mark. I was warned not to follow Rob, but I wasn't given a choice. <laughs> So the, the good thing is, um, my talk's very different. I'm not even gonna try to uh, be scientific. And in part, that's because I'm gonna be describing an ecosystem where science is not the driving factor. That's gonna be a shock to all of you that people in DC don't always make their decisions based on science. <laughs> um, you could say that politics trumps science. You can spell that with a big T or a little T, take your pick. Um, I do appreciate both the uh, large forehead and also the uh, moth. Thank you. Those are good segues. Um, but I, what I want to talk about is, um, you know, what do we, how do we get the right people to care enough to save what's out there? So Rob described a lot of things that we didn't even know exist before. It reminds me of the song, you know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And Susan told us that by the time we got around to figuring out that we should probably save some habitat here, a lot of it already was gone, and our job was to try and hold on to what we had left. Then the question is, how do you make that happen? Because the one species that's really driving the whole system is us. And then how do we get people to care? So I'm talking about a pretty simple ecosystem, I will call it an ego system, and that what I do is ego system management. <laughs> and it's both simpler 
and harder than a lot of what you've heard about today. So make sure, I, which button do I push? Hey, there it is. All right, you've already seen this bird. Um, I think the thing I, you know, we, most of you know is about 30 years ago, there was a, 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 a train wreck in the making in that development was potentially gonna to come to a halt because we all of a sudden realized we were losing all this habitat, we were gonna lose a species, the Endangered Species Act was gonna kick in and then what? So with the Endangered Species Act, which was passed in the early 70s, um, you make a list of what's almost gone. So this is in the United States. We've got all those animals, all those plants. Okay, what do we do about it? We know they're in trouble, but what do we do? So here's just a real quick timeline. Susan already gave you this. So we had the Endangered Species Act, and then less than a decade later, we realized we probably need to adjust it to make it um, implementable and added in HCPs and incidental take permits in Section 10. Then the state stepped in. California is, you know, mega diverse and, and we really needed to have our own approach to this stuff. Uh, the gnat catcher was listed, federally threatened in 93. And then after that, yeah, see, Planapalooza. So that's all the stuff that Susan was telling you about. We launched into these planning processes. I call it the butterfly effect here because you know you know about that where the butterfly in Africa flaps its wings and we get a hurricane in the East Coast. So this, really this whole HCP concept got started up near San Francisco. It's the last time one of these HCPs was started in a politically liberal area. Um, which makes the rest of this job harder. And it was San Bruno Mountain, and there were actually three butterflies, but the Mission Blue was the key driver, and the concept then of a habitat conservation plan came up as to how do you balance development and conservation. So the goal for the ESA, let's prevent extinction of these things that are almost gone, and then how, HCPs. Train wreck, that's the way the, the situation here was described to transformation of both, of all these things, mindsets, policies, and landscapes. And you've been learning a lot about the transformation of the landscapes uh, because of this new tool in the toolkit. And conflict to collaboration, and chaos to certainty. Now that certainty thing is a key thing that I'll touch on a little bit later. Single species to ecosystems. So these plans generally cover many species, uh, over 100 in the case of Western Riverside County. The idea is that these animals that are all at risk are at risk because they're losing habitat and they use a lot of the same habitat. So instead of thinking about things one species at a time, which is the way the ESA originally was, I think, implemented and conceived of, and it works for certain species, the golden, I mean, the bald eagle, other things like that, but in the case of a place like San Diego County, California in general, where you have the Mediterranean ecosystem, where you have really high diversity, you really need to take care of a bunch of species at once, and you do that by protecting the habitat. But all of that was, you know, as obvious as that seems to all of us here in this room, it was a new way of thinking, especially in D.C. The other thing I think to think about is, um, the way power is divided between different levels of government, even in the state of California, land use is very much a local government prerogative. That's where decisions are made about what goes where. They even get grumpy, as you may have noticed recently, if Sacramento tries to put a thumb on the scale and tell you what to build where. So we've had a couple of runs at trying to increase density near transit. And that's floundered because of objections of, of local government, concerned about too much power being taken from local government given to Sacramento. Now imagine you've got the federal government stepping in and trying to tell the local government how to plan its growth. And that gets really contentious. But these habitat conservation plans do a really good job of keeping that land use decision making at the local level, while also making sure that we are enforcing our uh, endangered species laws at both the state and federal level. So there, it's, it's, a, it's a great balance. All of that makes sense of us to here in California. So a key part of it is that you get that certainty that I was telling you about, that 
people like developers and, and um, local government officials, they know what the rules of the game are. And I'll touch on this again a little bit later, uh, where in other places that's super important and people get that and that's what they're willing to um, hang their hat on and say that they're in favor of is certainty, knowing what the rules of the game are. They don't want to be playing the game. They prefer that the game went away. But if they've got to play the game, they want to know what the rules are and know what they need to do. And the other thing is sharing the costs. And I'm going to touch on that, too, a little bit more. But these things aren't cheap. And you need to have, actually, a way that everybody kicks in uh, to make this happen. So this is kind of, uh, in, in a, I work on a bunch of different policy arenas. and a, big theme that comes up over and over and over again as I'm talking to decision makers in DC is it, we really want to have a both and world because we're trying to balance competing interests and we're trying to meet multiple needs. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how we can have, in this case, economic development and effective conservation, ecosystem um, protection, conservation. But I tell you what, we're running into a lot of people who think about the world as an either-or world, that it's a competition and not a collaboration. So we've had other runs at amending the Endangered Species Act. There's one that actually the Nature Conservancy supported that was in the late 90s. It was bipartisan. It was, um, you know, they had a Democratic administration and you had a Republican control of Congress and they came up with uh, some proposals that actually were broadly supported. That did not become law. And it did not become law because there was resistance in the House because they actually wanted to do more to tear things apart. So in the end, nothing really changed. And we're, we have the law we have because uh, neither one of these uh, efforts at, at changing the law succeeded. So really, we're having this competition between a both-and world and an either-or world. And, uh, you know, I have to live firmly in the both and world to even get up in the morning, and that's. So this is what it translates to is overall, nationally, we're actually protecting millions of acres. In California, it's hundreds of thousands of acres. And in fact, actually, I think now it does add up to well over a million acres by the time you add up all the plans up and down the state. And that's not cheap. And that costs literally billions of dollars. And one of the arguments that I and others make when we go to DC is that actually facilitates trillions of dollars of economic activity. So you go up three orders of magnitude every time, millions to billions to trillions. And yet that's not easy to get. And the other thing is that you need commitment. These plans last, the permits last 50 to 75 years in many cases. And that's a long time. And you can imagine that during that period of time, you're going to have a lot of turnover in leadership, especially at the local government level. And so you have a whole new generation of people coming along every once in a while saying, why are we doing this? This is not cheap. Why are, you know, can we just stop? And so you have to continually reach out and educate new people on, on this stuff. The other thing is that in the early days, this was only happening in California. And it was also a time when earmarks were allowed in Congress. And there was plenty of money. You may remember uh, in the late 90s, um, there were surpluses as far as the eye could see. And so there was plenty of money to spend on things. People weren't as worried about it. We basically had a program that was essentially an earmark for California because we were the only ones competing in it. There was one year we got $100 million nationally. And over $20 million, I think almost $30 million, was spent in San Diego County. <laughs> so it was, it was great while it lasted. Um, so this, these things started in Southern California. Then, then the development pressure kind of kicked in in that Interstate 80 corridor between the Bay Area and Tahoe. And so a number of counties there started doing these plans. And now they're actually happening all over the country, which is great. What it means, though, is that we actually have the same Actually, it's a lot less money. Now we're running at about half our high water mark in the more in the $50, $60 million range instead of the $100 million range that we had in the year 2001. But we have these plans popping up everywhere. So we're, we have more people competing for less money. That sounds like a real problem. 
What's helpful about it is that you actually now have potentially more friends to ask for the same thing if you can get them to do it. So uh, I'm just going to run through actually some of the places where this has popped up. In Northern California, we've got Kit Fox's Contra Costa County is a place. Um, that, that theme that I said where these things don't always pop up in the places where they're most politically popular is true. I don't know why these animals live in these places, but that's what happens. Um, Contra Costa County is, is in the Bay Area, sure, but it's actually one of the more conservative parts of the Bay Area. Um, but they have a great plan, the East Contra Costa plan, and it's, it's been protecting enormous amounts of habitat really successfully, and this is one of their signature species. Um, there's another kangaroo rat. I couldn't tell you exactly what kind. Maybe Susan could. But they're, they're, they're a big feature up in some of the Northern California plans, too. Texas. Okay, so one of the things that um, we were told, talk about a very simple ecosystem. Um, we're trying to persuade, when we go back, to try and persuade people to A, not mess with the Endangered Species Act too much, and B, please contribute to implementing it is we go to committee staff. So there's a appropriations subcommittee in the Senate. And we had the staffer there tell us in so many words last year, she goes, I only care about one number. You give me all this science, you bring me all these numbers. I care about one number. I want to know how many senators are asking me to fund this program. And I keep getting two. And they're both from California. And that's one state. So. That doesn't make it really easy for me to fit it into my bill, because there's other things that more people want. So basically, bring me at least one other senator from at least one other state. You know, just stop coming and telling me how great these plans are and how many species they save and blah, blah, blah. I just need you to get me one senator from one other state, ideally from another party. So that was our task. That was a couple of years ago. She was very blunt. Um, and so we, we started casting around. We talked to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So can you tell us where all these other plans are? And it turned out it wasn't really neatly assembled in one place. So we did a lot of work, and we worked with the regional folks at the Fish and Wildlife Service. And there are a lot of other Susans out there. Well, there's one Susan. But there's other people who um, sort of try to do what Susan does really well here. And we eventually got in touch with a bunch of other people that are the non-federal partners implementing these plans. And we started gathering. And we ended up running into somebody from Texas. There's, a, there's Williamson County, Texas. It's just north of Austin. It's the most conservative county in Texas, I'm told. That's what they say proudly. The people that I've come to know and, and like from there proudly say that. They're just north of Austin, which is about the bluest part of Texas. And they both have habitat plans. This species, the golden cheek warbler, is, is featured in the uh, liberal county there, Travis County. And, I, and actually, I've, been, I've heard it said that the only thing wrong with Austin, this is from other Californians, is that it's surrounded by Texas. <laughs> and, and actually, Williamson County is that other Texas. And, both of them now join us in Washington for the last couple of years and help ask for things. This, unfortunately, speaking of the fuzzy wuzzies earlier, in Williamson County, Texas, the really conservative one, this is one of their signature species. It's a blind cave cricket. So you can imagine Texans already not being real happy about the Endangered Species Act, and then they're being told they have to save blind cave crickets. <laughs> And then they start talking about um, cricket foraging areas. So you know you don't just save the cave. The crickets come out and they eat. And so they need a certain amount of space from the openings to, you know, that aren't disturbed so they can get their food. So it's really fun to have uh, make the rounds with Texans who are explaining why um, they're being forced to uh, save blind cave crickets and protect cricket foraging areas. So it would be nice if we had more charismatic species. but. Um, Utah has a great plan. That's also another um, well-known liberal state. Um, Arizona, another one, the Chiricahua leopard frog there. Florida, the Florida panther actually is a charismatic species, and they are doing a lot of work there in Collier County. 
um, which is sort of south central Florida. What's interesting there is with sea level rise, much of southern Florida is like less than five feet in elevation, so it's probably going to be underwater in less than a century. And all the people are on the coast. So the Panthers kind of had the middle of that part of the state to itself for years. It's not going to anymore because people are moving in there. So now they're trying to figure out how to save the Panther. So we have a really great partnership with the people from Collier County. And our real hunter, our real target in Florida is this species. <laughs> and actually, he's, he's being helpful lately, so that's good. So that, that last thought is the one I will, we keep sharing in DC that I want to leave you with, that we're not doing this just to save the blind cave crickets. One of the things they're finding even in Williamson County is that by being forced to plan for these species, they're actually leaving more open space in their communities as they grow. It makes it a nicer place to live. Also, people can be proud of their natural heritage, the fact that they have plants and animals that exist nowhere else on Earth, that they can keep seeing them, people can come to see them. And so this is a really important message in the both and world is that when you're helping nature, you're actually helping people. And then that allows us to get those millions of dollars in federal money that leverage the billions of dollars in private investment that facilitate the trillions of dollars of economic activity. And that's the message. And that all started here. So you should all be proud of that. Thanks, Mark. So at this point, I'll have all the speakers come up and turn into panelists. And I, I understand there's a microphone roaming. Is that right, Michael? To, that people in the audience asking questions? Oh, we'll repeat the question? OK. So. so we're happy to take questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a surprise, because I always thought coastal sage trails with the laurel sumac would be the component. I thought it was something they needed. I think that what happens after fire is the sumac takes, uh, the cover of sumac increases so much more at the expense of other species. But you're right, it's an element out there, um, but the cover increases, and um, especially when it occurs at the with the loss of the Artemisia and the Areogonum, um, it it creates that negative effect. Or Just replacement. right, and I'm sorry. Right off the bat, I didn't repeat the question. And the, so now that you've heard the answer, the question was, what is up with the laurel sumac as a negative factor or negative association with gnat catcher occurrence following fire? Isn't laurel sumac an element of coastal sage scrub. So you heard the answer. Sorry. And we'll, we'll use this mic for anyone who's got a question. That's a really good idea, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the presentation by Todd, which was really interesting, you mentioned a bit about kind of an emerging threat that I think most people in this room know, which is the effects of wildfire encouraging the spread of exotic species. Um, in view of that, I'm just curious how the environmental community in San Diego is planning on responding to the CAL FIRE uh, vegetation treatment plan, which proposes vast amounts of burning in a way that doesn't necessarily take the natural fire regime and all of those environmental variations into account. I'll give you the statewide perspective, and I can do this now because I'm no longer employed by the state. <laughs> so, you know, despite our partners, CAL FIRE has, in my opinion, and in many other opinions of the people who work for fish and wildlife at the state level, feel that they've made vast assumptions that are improbable and bad judgment. and 
we're currently sort of holding them to task. They've, they've rewritten this plan probably, you, you may or may not know this, three times now, and it's still, oh, is it more than that? Thank you. I knew it was more than two. But it's, it's bad news. It's, it's sort of the bastions of past thinking that are holding sway in various parts of our government from the middle levels to the top right now. And it's not workable. That's all I'd like to say. Uh, uh, this question is to Susan. You mentioned that the uh, North County MHCP, that only one city within the planning area of that uh, that planning effort uh, has actually entered into an implementing agreement and, and is properly implementing the plan that was developed, uh, what, 20 years ago by Sandag and, and, and the cities. Um, what's your thought about how, or, or have you and, and folks from the state uh, Fish and Wildlife looked at the effects of all those other jurisdictions not having entered into implementing agreements on the overall effectiveness of that plan and how, how has the state and federal government sort of responded to that in terms of rationalizing approval of additional projects in areas that, uh, that, are in, that would otherwise be protected? Well, so, so that's a tricky question. Um, well, I guess I'll say a couple things. So even though they don't have permits, because the, the reserve design was done, as you pointed out, and, and adopted, um, the projects are in, informed by that reserve design. And so generally speaking, I'm sure everyone can cite an example where they didn't go forward that way. When those projects come in at the local land you, you know, use, they are, they are being, um, it, you know, under CEQA, they are being addressed and, and compared to the reserve design and, and the mitigation is being directed to the preserve areas. And so components of the reserve design are happening even in the absence of permits. Um, you know, we're still working with um, the city of Oceanside with hopes that, that we can get that plan permitted. I think if regional funding could be um, made available that cities like uh, Escondido who have, um, did a front loaded their reserve, you know, they, Daily Ranch being a prime example, you know, Encinitas, some of these cities are built out, so it's not that there's you know, a real threat from future development, but it's the management and monitoring component, and, and you know, it takes money. And so I think you know, thinking about, um, you know, we had the Quality of Life Initiative, which was, was our, our hope for regional funding. I think if that regional funding can be developed, you know, that might encourage those cities that are you know, pretty much built out but have con you know, important reserve lands um, to come forward. I think the other thing that's happening that's helping is that, you know, again, a lot of those, those cities still do have open space, homeowners areas or land managed by um, CNLM and others. And, you know, again, we have land management grants that Sandag funds each year. And so there are, you know, there are things happening. SDMMP does not limit itself to the permitted areas. And so, you know, the, the work and the management and monitoring strategic plans do look across all the conserved lands on the landscape, regardless of, of that aspect. So, you know, I think we're doing the best we can and, um, you know, and we keep trying and, and working with those jurisdictions that have some critical pieces, you know, with Oceanside, the connectivity to Camp Pendleton. Clearly, the North County plan is a high priority. Um, again, that connection up to Riverside. And, you know, again, I think if the region works together on regional funding, that will help bring those other jurisdictions that, that don't have the big development drivers but have some key pieces of the landscape. I have a question here. Hi. Um, so this is a question about connecting uh, planning, science, and politics at the local scale and uh, with some practical politics in mind. So uh, there's lots of regional and city, uh, city planning staff here, and so I think this is an especially valuable uh, place to have this conversation. Uh, as many of you know, the city of San Diego, um, many of its communities are undergoing community plan updates right now, uh, which means that in the, 42, you know, uh, in the 42 community planning areas in the city of San Diego where there is MHPA, uh, the city is really doing a pretty good job of bringing more and more of those plans into the update status. And what that means practically is that um, open space, uh, habitat, and MHPA land is open at the moment 
in many of these communities for input. Uh, and plans will be written for the next 25 to 30 years that will determine whether that land is saved or whether it is not saved. And so really I want to ask a question about how this group can get involved in that process uh, and, and to, to aid, in that, you know, to aid in, that, in that effort to secure the most valuable pieces of land. A, a quick bit of context and then, and then I'll pose that question. So uh, I live in the University City area up by uh, the Golden Triangle, uh, just adjacent to MCAS Miramar. We've got the Tri Canyons Park there, Rose Canyon, San Clemente Canyon. You would have seen those at the western nub end of a really rich core of uh, uh, gnat catcher habitat. Uh, we've got over 1,000 acres of open space there, and we are connected to MCAS Miramar, which is about 21,000 acres, which runs all the way to the foothills, right? Uh, there are a couple of choke points uh, where there is land that is between us and MCAS Miramar, and those choke points are open for uh, debate right now. The city is very resistant to uh, having that land set aside permanently, either through dedication or permanent conservation in, in the MHPA. Uh, and I would really like to know how we can, what tools are available, how you can help us ensure that the city of San Diego will preserve those choke points so that that portion, that thousand acres to the, the most humid portion of that uh, coastal uh, that coastal region where the, where the gnat catcher is, how we can uh, make sure that that's not clipped off from the large regions that are to the east uh, and how that uh, habitat will remain there for resilience in the future because it's the least likely to burn in the future because it's the most humid, humid portion of that, uh, of that habitat. What are the practical tools uh, that we can use, that we can employ? What do you recommend for communities like ours across San Diego and across Southern California? Can I ask a clarifying question? So are these lands that are outside of the identified MHPA preserve? It varies. Some are 75 percent conserved. Um, all of the city-owned land that I'm talking about. So, so from our standpoint, the, yeah, from our perspective, the MHPA does connect to Miramar and, and you know, over time, those areas as, as land use progresses should, should address that connectivity and maintain that connectivity. Um, uh, should and and you know the city has you know and Christy Forberger is here somewhere um, you know <laughs> maybe she wants to jump in here but the MSCP group re reviews each of those projects as they come in to ensure that consistency and those those environmental CEQA documents certainly should document that consistency with the city's plan and so as a citizen you know watching that those public reviews you know if you think that they're they're not doing that. That's your forum to um, to participate and point that out. Um, the state and federal agency, we certainly do a similar. We read those CEQA documents and, and point out when we see inconsistencies. Um, I believe each project that comes through the city does have to be routed through Christie's group to um, review for consistency with MSCP. Um, and um, that's, I guess that's my best, I don't know, Christy, did I? He covered it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we probably have time for one more question. Sir. All right. Since I'm right, since I'm right here, it's just a general question because there's a pattern in San Diego where the species on the, that are, occur on the coast tend to be in small, isolated, some, somewhat or completely isolated areas. Um, and while the species that occur more inland, of course, have the bigger habitat areas because those areas are less developed or state or federal lands. Uh, and, and also, the, the coastal species, I think, uh, at least in my opinion, are more at risk from climate change because this area is going to get hotter and drier, and these are species that are adapted to more uh, moisture. So this is more of a question for Rob, but really for everybody, is um, do we just go for big parks and kind of ignore, and just let right off the coast, you know, just say the coast is toast, or do we have two separate uh, things where we, we work out, we plan for big parks in the inland and we uh, practice uh, more social eco ecology where we try and get people to save these little parks in the coast and see if we can make a go of it. Uh, well, I think T Todd, again, kind of presented that really well earlier, just that all this environmental variability along the coast, so like by 
Torrey Pines is different than Point Loma, it's different than T1 Estuary. I mean, there's a lot of variability that's driving a lot of this diversification. And I, I, I think, like I call it boutique reserves. I think, you know, regulatory, you know, regulatory wise, we need to have these boutique reserves for these animals that only occur in certain places, right? And they're, and they're gonna stand alone, they're gonna have higher investment in management. And so the 5,000 hectare inflection point I was talking about is basically you're investing up front in land and you're less, you have a less investment long term in management. And so for these coastal reserves, you're gonna be fighting Argentine ants, weeds, the, the, the house cats, all that stuff. And that's gonna be your long term investment in managing to have those, those boutique reserves like Torrey Pines would be a boutique reserve or Point Loma might be a boutique reserve. But, but by getting these larger lands inland, Early doing that early investment in land, you're you're going to have a less per acre investment long term, and 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 that's kind of the trade off. But but I think biogeographically, for the reasons that Todd talked about earlier, you're you, you have some diversity that's only going to be you know small and in, in in patches, and and we have to just deal with that within the the footprint of what's there. And I think if you go to El Segundo, if anybody's been to El Segundo, the city, they love the butterfly. Like the, you just walk down the main street in El Segundo, and there's butterflies in, you know, impressed in the cement there, and they take, they've taken ownership of that, and so I think getting people to take ownership of that, you know, Dudley or Blackmani or whatever it is that lo local species that's in those preserves that are in their backyards, I think would would be one way to build that public more and public investment in 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 those local patches. Um, but but I, I think just selling those those what's important about Point Loma type thing would be would be good. Great. Let's give the panel a round of applause.